this if you're able. Let's sing together. We have come to his house and gathered in his name. Thank you so much for this opportunity this morning to gather together to worship you to hear whatever it is you would have to say to each of us please help us to open our hearts today and our minds and our spirits to you to get closer to you to hear what it is that you would have us do and the people we would be we ask this in Jesus name amen Good morning, my brothers and uh, sisters, in person and on Facebook. Uh, welcome into this sanctuary. Think of it as a sanctuary with wall, without walls. There, you out there on uh, Facebook, where our mission is to honor Christ, to grow in Christ, and to serve Christ. Come and dwell in the house of the Most High. Come, for God is with us as we gather and will keep us wherever we go. Come experience the grace of God and know that God treasures us individually and together. Now let us continue and bring our sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. Thanksgiving. 
Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of confession. We confess to you, O Lord, the worries that trouble our days, the anxieties about our families and friends, concerns about employment and the economy, and a troubling lack of confidence in our own talents and abilities to cope with problems. We confess to you, O Lord, the worries that face our church, the concerns about the health and well-being of congregation members, the questions about the future direction of our church life, and the different opinions about how to follow Jesus best. We confess to you, O Lord, the worries that cloud our world, the tensions concerning injustice, poverty, and climate change, the anxieties about violence within and without, and the lack of confidence in the capacity of our leaders to achieve a meaningful peace. We confess our concerns to you, O Lord. We pray, O God, that you loosen their grip upon us, let our fears fall away, and bless us to know your peace and will. And now, would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 10. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house visible, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. May God add his understanding to the reading of Silly Word.
in our community. <laughs> Where are we going on Tuesday? <laughs> got it, got it. Do we have any announcements? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. So we had we had one of our people missing um, from videos last week, and so Kathy's gonna tell us about Alison Oya and how she's doing. First of all, I want to say hi, Allie. I hope you're watching. Hi, Allie. <laughs> okay. So Allie sent us some. Um, slides with some words of um, hers. She um, finished her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology with a minor in History. And I did you a favor and I put this on my phone so that I could read it to you because um, if you're anything like me, I can't see. In May of 2022, I was continuing to have trouble working at Starbucks due to a major wrist injury which required surgery. I took medical employment insurance for three months while continuing physical therapy and my road to recovery. August 29th, I started a new job working as an administrative assistant in an office. Before the Christmas break, they were asking me to become full-time. I am working with an amazing team and a management company called DMD Family Dental and Orthodontics. Can you read that? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a hobby, I started growing them. Here, here we go, right here. What is she growing? Uh, as a hobby, I started growing a, a bonsai from seed and have been building an aquatic ecosystem over the course of the last couple of months. This is the aquarium today, and I really enjoy having a science project to check in on on a daily basis. The female, oh boy. <laughs> you say beta. Um, beta. It's a beta fish. Veil tail beta was my most recent and final for now addition to the ecosystem housing fire red cherry shrimps and panda corridora catfish as well as live plants. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Overall, now that I've finished school, I'm just taking the time to work and enjoy life with no specific plans for the future. Missing all, Ali Oya. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, and congratulations, Ali, on your graduation from college. Yay. Kathy, I want to say one other thing. Okay. Okay, thank you, Becky. So where are we going on Tuesday? <laughs> okay, so remember that we can, um, we can get takeout or all day you can go for lunch and dinner, but there'll be several of us there from probably 5.30 onwards um, enjoying ourselves and enjoying the fellowship. So please come out um, and tell your friends and share the flyer. Um, so we get more um, income. And I believe that um, there's a care portal announcement from Meredith. Okay, this one is a bit of an odd story, and I did check on that uh, the children weren't about to be taken anyway. There was a care portal request for a large window with frame to go in one of those prefab uh, sheds like we see over at Home Depot, where a father and a mother and two children were all living in that as a bedroom, but behind the grandmother's house, so they could use the bathroom and the kitchen in there. When the mother died in childbirth and the father uh, did his best to hang in there, but they managed to get bunk beds, and then she get some other things, but uh, apparently they need to have a window or DCFS will not uh, bless the habitation or approve of the habitation. So we bought them a win. We, well, we gave them a gift certificate, to get, a gift card to get 
a window over at Home Depot under the supervision of social worker so that they could all stay together. Well, thank you. Whatever it takes, huh? Morning, all. Will you pray with me? Almighty Creator, parent of us each, help us to proclaim with simplicity and clarity the promise of your love and compassion. Let us tell by your actions what we have learned through your good news to our brothers and sisters. Through Jesus, bless us to bring those who live in doubt and fear to trust you as revealed in your Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. 
As we hear today, Jesus continues to talk to us about discipleship. Last week we heard about the, uh, the power of authority associated with discipleship. We heard about casting out demons. We heard about cleansing lepers. We heard about raising the dead. Next week, we'll hear about the ultimate rewards of being a disciple. Today, however, Jesus warns us of three critical concerns interfering with the, interfering and complicating with living the life of a disciple. These concerns are crucial, and for each disciple, they require continuous vigilance. Now this morning, we need to recognize that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This time, he is not speaking to all of his followers. This is not the Sermon on the Mound. It's not parables on a hill. It's not some tales told in the synagogue. This is one of those times when Jesus is specific. This is one of those times like when Jesus speaks to God or speaks to Satan or speaks to Pilate. This is one of those times when Jesus pulls aside his disciples and speaks to them individually. But no matter who we are, a follower, a guest, or a disciple, whenever Jesus speaks, we all have something to learn. What? though, is a disciple. Who are these 12? What are these 12 that he's pulled apart? Disciples, all disciples are followers, but not all followers are disciples. Followers, if you want to look at it one way, are disciples waiting to be. A disciple is one who makes a decision, who makes a decision to commit to a life of learning about and from Jesus, and whose learning is then evident in the behavior of their life. The difference with a disciple is a matter of commitment and a matter of priorities. There are many disciples here this morning in this church. There is one, I believe, still in a hospital bed over in Panorama City. There are many types of disciples. An apostle apostle is one type of a disciple, someone that goes out and evangelizes into the world. Other disciples are preachers or healers or teachers or musicians or lawyers. Some labor in the food or clothing or housing industry. Disciples have talents, like all people, but they are united by the fact that at some point they have decided to offer their talents to serve Christ. And then each of those talents is taken by the Holy Spirit and activated into a spiritual gift you will find disciples, regardless of talents, using their faith, using their gifts. You won't probably see them over at the leper colony these days or out at a mental institution seeing who they can cure, but they're out there. You can tell because they won't be wearing a badge or a tiara. They will be, however, out there facing down hate with love, injury with forgiveness, doubt with faith, despair with hope, darkness with light, sadness with joy, and sickness or suffering with healing. Disciples are the type of people that prefer prefer consoling to being consoled. They prefer seeking to understand rather than being understood. They tend to prefer loving rather than being loved, and they focus on eternal life rather than death. 
So the good news, my friends, followers and disciples out there, is that you too can be a disciple if you choose to use that God-given gift in a particular way. Jesus holds all of these contributions worthy to the kingdom. The contribution of a disciple that is an apostle is important, but it's no more important to the kingdom than the, the contribution of, of any other disciples. Example, when you go to a movie, what do you remember? What remains in your mind? Probably the actor, the actresses, the performance, right? How many of you have ever been on a movie or a television set? How many of you stayed after the movie and watched the credits roll by? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people function behind that camera without arrangers, without film editors, without cinematographers. Sorry, no matter the actors, no crew, no cinema. The kingdom requires talents from each of us. Disciples are critical to the building of the kingdom. That's why Jesus spends so much time pulling them aside, talking to them alone, teaching them alone, giving them additional information and instruction about the kingdom. He's there, and he's with them there so much because the disciples are so important. They're critical to the building of the kingdom. A church consisting of just Jesus and some guests and no disciples is a little bit like a cruise ship with a captain and some guests and no crew. Disciples are critical. Disciples. Now Jesus raises his first critical concern this morning. He tells the disciples to know their place in the scheme of things. The disciple is not above the teacher. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher. A disciple cannot be Jesus. He can serve as Jesus served. She can strive to imitate Christ. And that, my friends, is good news. Good news we need to remember. Be yourself. Let God be God. Jesus is the one that's going to oversee salvation, ultimate healing, and speaking for the Father. The Father oversees the way the world works, how people see the light, and things like retribution and judgment. The Holy Spirit is going to be in charge of wisdom and sustaining us and ultimate comfort. Know your place. The second critical concern that Jesus raises this morning is probably one of the most important for disciples. Knowing what to fear and what not to fear. We all experience fear. And in its proper place, it's a, it serves as a good alert to us. Hmm, that car is making a funny sound this morning. Is that smoke I smell? That kind of fear has its place, but out of control, fear is a danger to everyone. When we are at the point of being terrorized, we can lose all courage, become overly reluctant, panic into irrational actions, cross over into hysteria, and even become paralyzed and surrender to overwhelming destruction, the deer caught in the headlights that refuses to move. Extreme fear 
can block other emotions or aspirations. Extreme fear can endanger dogged obedience or conformity to more powerful interests, often immoral interests. Fear is the primary cause for the failure among disciples. Remember Good Friday? Jesus mentions fear arising from two traditional enemies. Enemy number one, those who can kill the body but not the soul. The first type of this enemy Jesus is referring to is corrupt secular powers, the Romans and the Herodians in his time. They're sort of depraved powers, but they're still with us. They use empty facades, bold lies, half troops in the hopes of engendering silence in the face of brash deceit. They foment and explode violence and fear of death for their own purpose, and that purpose is usually their gaining or maintaining control illegally. Jesus affirms that in themselves they cannot destroy a righteous soul. The arc of God's judgment stretches long, but it always ends in justice. The second type of enemy that causes fear is one that to the people of the first century was incredibly real. Demons, the devil, Satan, Lucifer. If we read the New Testament, we'll see those forces cropping up. There was a confrontation in the wilderness. There was that scene with the pigs running off the cliff. There was that insane man uh, out in the area of Gerenesius. For the first century person, these demons were real. Historically, in, in the course of history, we've kind of characterized those forms. You probably would recognize somebody in a red costume with a tail and a pitchfork and, and uh, cloven hooves. Graphically, monstrously developed in caricature. Many profess to be too sophisticated, too educated to give credence to such cartoon, cartoon creatures and conclude that in life there's really no such thing. A few years ago, there was a noir classic film called The Usual Suspects. To this day, it still haunts for many reasons. If for no other reason, then in one of the discussions between a sergeant and one of the suspects, they're discuss discussing an utterly evil character named Kaiser Suze. The suspect, verbal Kant, observes that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he did not exist. Now, one, whether one subscribes or ascribes to caricatures or not, there is evil in the world. And that evil does not, does not emanate from God. Evil loathes and despises an inclusive God who welcomes, who creates, who parents, who heals, who forgives, a God who comforts and sustains, renews and resurrects, a God who above all loves. Evil will disguise itself and use secular powers to suffer, to inflict suffering and despair. Evil will even try to use 
good Christians who in their desire for justice, for purity as they define it, or vengeance, will be seduced into fighting darkness with even more darkness. Evil seeks the temptations by which anyone, especially followers and disciples, may be led astray and into endangering their soul. The good news, as Jesus says, is you don't have to fear them. There is a part of each of us, of each of you, your soul, that is God's property. They cannot, whatever else they can do, they cannot destroy your soul. And then, as Tim read, Jesus speaks the line, but be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul. What a firestorm of theological debate that single line has engendered to raise through the century. There are all sorts of interpretations. What did Jesus talk about? Is he talking about Satan again? Is he talking about God? What kind of God is this then that's waiting up there to, um, to destroy bodies and destroy souls? This morning, let's think of another interpretation of that line about the one who can destroy body and soul. Perhaps Jesus, who knows human behavior better than anyone, is saying to some, if you live your life, if you choose to live your life in fear, and let that fear determine all your actions, still don't fear Satan or the sexual powers. No good will come of that. But if you're that kind of person for whom the fear of God is the only thing that will make you take the right decision, then by all means fear God. Because then at least something good will come out of that. To Jesus, our God opposes all forms of evil. It is and is that power in whom we can be confident, composed, and courageous. Actually, God is the antithesis of fear. And three times in this passage that Tim wrote, read to us this morning, being not afraid is alluded to. Actually, 365 times in the Bible, we read, be not afraid. And usually it's, be not afraid of God. Our God, the Almighty, the I Am, is precisely the ultimate one we do not have to fear. We can trust him with our lives, our souls, our bodies, and every bit of the time, talent, and treasure we have been gifted. Jesus goes on, then, in this passage, to tell us what God is really like. What is God really like? Well, first, God's intention is that the day will come when truth and justice will prevail. The whole world, which has ignored and despised us for the good we have tried to do, will see our loyalty, our faith, our patience, our perseverance, and it will all be pulled out into the bright light of day. The love with which we have quietly sacrificed for others will be shouted from the housetops. That's what all that secrets finally being revealed is about. What is our Father really like? 
Our Father deeply and lovingly cares for every single one of his creatures. Even the smallest sparrow, his eye is always on the sparrow. His eye is always on each one of us. Our Father counts every hair on our head. Imagine every person that's ever lived, living now, ever will live, every hair on every head is counted. The, that care testifies to the enormous value our God places on each of our lives. And, in pro, and the last way that God is, he protects us in proclaiming the messenger and the messenger. God has appointed Jesus, whatever happens, to be at our side, no matter what, whatever may come, Jesus is at our side. He is our advocate. He is our defender. He is our protector. God sends his own son to be at our side. That's how God is. Then Jesus raises the final critical concerns. Disciples, know your priorities. For a disciple, the top priority is Jesus, always. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Being a disciple is not just some way to survive in today's one dangerous world. Being a disciple is not an insurance policy for guaranteeing one is going on to a better place after death. Being a disciple is not about feeling, ah, Jesus just really did a good job of modeling some of God's better ideas. And that personally resonates with me. I want to put that out there. Being a disciple, in the end, being a disciple is about behaving like Jesus and getting into trouble for doing so. Whoa, getting into trouble for doing, for being like Jesus? What's that about? That's about getting into trouble because Jesus is and has always been about establishing a whole new way of being God's people. It's revolutionary. What he preaches is radical. What he tells us is heaven sent. Now, institutions, structures, power that be are alarmed by Jesus then and now. There are those who are invested in the current, as current things are, how they're run, despite many and horrible inequities and failures. These are the people, don't rock the boat. Don't upset the status quo. Change is too darn expensive. Leave me alone with all that talk. Every time, every time God tries to rescue or better his children, there are always some who are convinced that they don't, don't need saving or improvement. They're there already. They are comfortably profiting just as things are, and they will fight to stay on top. Micah 7, 6 details all the trials and tribulations unleashed when God tries something new. He is a prophet, tried to voice that something new. Jesus quotes directly from Micah in the passage that Tim read. All that talk, all that talk about daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws going at it and sons and fathers going at it, that's out of Micah. Micah had a very long, long list there. You'll also find bribe judges, enslaving people, and marching dictators going around. But for we, we focus on that, that kind of family talk, don't we? Well, to be clear, 
Jesus is not anti-family. Jesus is not encouraging any of us to jump up and jettison our families. Jesus is not sanctioning, shirking family responsibilities to come down to the church and work all the time. When, in fact, one of Jesus' final acts on the cross was to make sure that his mother had a new family, a new family to go to. And in fact, many of the disciples took members of their family on their missionary trips. We're not talking anti-family here. Now, in Jesus' time, the family was built on an autocratic, patriarchal power system defined by blood lineage and dogma. Loyalty and obedience and subservience to that family structure was the priority, the priority, the largest priority in society. Women and children had no rights and very little value. Now, Jesus is certainly not a poster child for that type of family. For Jesus, family life is determined by how well it is doing God's will. He's talking about priority for Jesus and a disciple. Again, honoring Christ, growing in Christ, and serving Christ outweighs all other priorities. It does not exclude them, but it is the top priority. And strangely enough, strangely enough, so often when serving God through Jesus is the highest priority, a better world emerges in the here and now. And when the good news of Jesus is heard and embraced as the supreme concern, then all those other individual, family, and societal priorities thrive. Seek the kingdom of God first, then all the other needs will be met. But, okay, Jesus, how do we keep that priority? How do we keep you on top? It's difficult. It's difficult, even for those who knew him. Peter denied him. Judas, Judas betrayed him. All the others deserted him. But the key for most was they stopped. They went back. They thought about it. And they once again reshifted their priorities. A disciple checks and rechecks and checks and makes sure in their list of priorities Jesus is at the top. Jesus is at the top. Secondly, the word disciple means learn. Disciple keeps learning through observation, through experience, through prayer, and through the word, especially the New Testament. Go back. Take Jesus 101. Luke 20, 27, the great commandment. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the judgment of nations. Luke 6, 20 through 49, the sermon on the plain. Matthew 5, 3 through 11, the sermon on the mount. Or simply, take a verse, stick it on your refrigerator, and look at it first thing in the morning. Micah 6, 8. Do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Most people catch most of that. They catch the business about justice and kindness and God. But listen carefully. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God, your God, your God is a relationship. Walk with your God. Walk without fear. Walk with trust. Walk with he who created us, parents us, and is with us forever. Walk with he 
who saves us, heals us, and teaches us. Walk with she who sustains us and comforts us and serves as our source of wisdom. Want to be a disciple? Walk. Walk with your Lord. Amen. And now it's time to give back to God a portion of what we've been given. Please join me. For all the wondrous things you have done for us, O Lord, we give you thanks. You bless us with the strength to go on. You bless us with protective refuge. You bless us with forgiveness and unconditional love. Guide us through your will to be channels of your gospel of good news to all we meet. Let us pray. O Lord, gracious and compassionate Creator, in your eyes, even the smallest.
sparrow has value, and in your love, you take time to count the hairs of our head. O oh Lord, you come to us not only from the past, but in every moment we live, and in every moment we serve one another in your Son's name. We now bring our joys and concerns before you, trusting in your steadfast love, knowing that through your grace we'll, we will be blessed. Our attention is called to the prayer list that is in this morning's bulletin and we offer our prayers and our thoughts and our hopes for all that are listed there. This morning, we also lift up Melissa Laser, who is recovering from a kidney infection. She is in Kaiser Hospital, uh, and we know that you have cradled her Lord, Jesus, the ultimate healer, has been there and has been by her side, and she is doing much better. And we thank you, Lord, for that healing. And we thank you for Meredith, who took her to the hospital and stayed there for four hours in the emergency room before she was admitted and then long after. We thank you for that act of generosity. It's inspiring. We also, dear Lord, lift up Jose Bernal, a good friend of Terry and Priscilla's, who is in recovery now from major surgery. We ask you, Lord, that your healing presence be upon Jose and that your wisdom be on the discernment of healthcare workers as they treat and prescribe and help Jose to heal. Please, Lord, be with us, Jose, his family and friends. Help him to recover quickly and bring him back to us. We thank you, Lord, for all the prayers of the people out there who are joining us on Facebook this morning, and we lift up their prayers and concerns as they mention them in silence here to you. We also, dear Lord, take a moment to lift up those prayers that are in our hearts, those prayers that we could not express openly this morning. We lift them up to you. Almighty I am, Savior and Comforter, for we know that you hear them 